呃，这嗯，我们下面有请这个 Eric de c h a u s e 啊，法国国立学院的院长啊，他给我们讲的讲座，他的题目是《绘画的终结》。啊，这个 Eric 以前就来我们学校做过很好几次讲座，啊，他每每次都非常受欢迎。他是二十世纪西方艺术史的专家，我们看到很多书里头写到西方艺术史的，尤其是法国的、欧洲的，都是他写的。啊，所以很期待他的讲座。Thank you and、uh, thank you for the introduction. Um, I'm not going to be completely global. I'm not going to rethink modernity.、Uh, I think. Um, I want to focus on one issue that has to do with modernity, though, and which is very international, even if I focus on certain parts of the world, and not others. But I'll come back to that.、Um, right from the start, the story of abstract painting has been hand in glove with its own appearance or show passage. That is, with the end of painting and the end of art. Indeed, several monsters who in the 1910s invented abstraction as a pictorial form of his own life quickly envisioned this process to be a natural consequence. And those who disappear of the description of the figure of function of painting and the reduction of the potential essential elements. That would lead inexorably to the making of last painting, and to the end of the tradition originated in Western art with the emerging of easel painting in the 14th century. Thus, Piet Van Lian returned to full-on abstraction in 1917 with his composition in lines. From then on, he created pictures devoid of any reference to the outside world, which he considered potential models for the spiritual and actual life of their viewers. From the very moment Mondrian developed what he would call in 1920 neoplasticism, which formally translated into the reduction of painting to the trio of primary colors and a black orthogonal network. Over a white background, he envisioned the extension of painting into architecture. First, in his own studio, whose walls he covered with the tender colored panels, but also in commissioned decorative photographs. In the last scene, so-called scene of his conversation-like treaty. Natural reality and abstract reality published in the English Guide between 1919 and 1920. He even suggested that I quote the abstract real life, that is, his real plastic painting, is only a preparation for the transformation of social life and the aspect of what surrounds. Us all together, thus envisioning the death of painting and its replacement by a complete social and political system. If Mondrian did not give up painting eventually, his views of Dutch shape on his 1942-1943 paintings, which he did not achieve before his death, which marked more like part of the process, a means for an end, a way to delineate colored shapes that he ultimately painted. It was mainly simply because the world had not been sufficiently transformed by painting. So much so that it could do without. Ergo, Casimir Malevich, who during the 1915 exhibition, 0.10 in Petrograd, revealed all at once to the public his supermatist composition, pictures of simple shapes on white background. According to him, they created, and most notably the black square, the first step. To pure creation in art. So again, the idea that painting is only a limited moment and would be surpassed. The prolegomena of a new reality. Within two years, they would lead to series which reach the limits of pictoriality. First, to the dissolution of shapes with the 1917-1918 series plans for dissolution, where geometric shapes seem to vanish in the white background. 
and then to the disappearance of color with the 1918 series of colorless supermatic compositions, commonly named white on white, where a simple white shape is painted over a white background, discernible only by its texture. Magievich one only partially conceived these pictures as his last paintings. Um, even though from 1919, 1920 to 1926, his new works, uh, plans or models, which he titled Architectons, were all part of the non-utilitarian uh, utilitarian, utopian field of architecture, Malievich would still carry on painting, but for teaching purposes only. During that time, he revisited some designs he had created previously in order to produce useful models for his pupils and the visitors uh, of his exhibitions, and to establish a logical narrative for his own artistic development by backdating a great many pictures of that period. So that's the case, for example, at the Black Square, this version from the late 1920s, which is actually a replica of the 1950s pictures now in uh, Petrograd. There are two versions in, in, uh, in St. Petersburg, excuse me. Um, and, and one of them, uh, this one, is only, uh, is, was backdated 1915 when it was shown also. Um, his true return to painting, which was also a return to figuration from 1928 until his death in 1935, only happened because the utopia he hoped for and wanted to be a part of. He wrote of, uh, in 1928 that, I quote, the renewal of life begins with artistic form, end of the quote, was brutally stopped in 1932 by Stalin, who proclaimed the end of artists' autonomy and its replacement with a strict control by the Soviet state and the Communist Party. The first last painting created as such in the history of art appeared in the wake of Malevich's immediate legacy when after the 1917 Bolshevik revolution in Russia some of his heterodox disciples turned to constructivism. These disciples regarded themselves then as workers not producing works of art but objects and images instead aimed at the factual analysis of material elements that are integral of art. These objects and images bore no autonomous purposes, but their principles were to be applied to the fabrication of useful products for the new emerging society. It was against this background that during the first part of the 1925 5x5 20, uh, equal 25 exhibition in Moscow, Alexander Rochenko showcased three monochrome pictures, pure red color, pure yellow color, and pure blue color, as a farewell, a sign of his ability to quit painting in order to wholly devote himself to the Bolshevik Revolution. In 1939, he summed up his ambition at the time. I quote him. I reduced painting to its logical conclusion and exhibited three canvases, red, blue, and yellow. I stated, it's all over. Um, while commenting on, well, first thing um, is this fact that, so this is the first last painting conceived as a last painting and of course it's not one painting it's three paintings uh, because even when you're saying it's the last painting it is still alive and, and trying to force you to do something else um, while commenting on Rochenko's triptych which he significantly reduced in the political context of the time to the sole red rectangle the art critic Nikolai Tarabukin published in 1922 uh, an expanded version of a lecture he had given in August 1921, a few days before the opening of uh, 5 by 5 equals 25, titled The Last Painting Has Been Painted. Uh, so, in this case, we are uh, considering only one last painting, 
the red monochrome, and of course it's chosen just for the political significance and symbol of uh, the color red in the uh, uh, context of the Russian Revolution. Driven by historicism, ideology, and teleology, Tarabukin wrote, I quote him, Every time that an artist truly wanted to get rid of representation, he only succeeded at the expense of the destruction of painting and his own destruction as a painter. End of the quote. And in a few months, constructivism turned into productivism. In war, Bolshevism in Russia, painting was dead for the most sincere and extreme supporters of the new regime, which still endorsed, on the side, artists capable of producing propaganda paintings in a more traditional style. It was only after the abandon of utopian designs by the regime following the death of Lenin that they would bring painting back to life. From 1930 up until his death in 1956, Wachenko would then paint clowns and decorative or experimental abstraction, such as expressive rhythm uh, from 43-44, an odd composition made of networks of dripping paint, which strongly resembles what Jackson Pollock was creating at the same time in New York, without any possibility whatsoever that any of them could know what the other one was doing. Uh, so maybe you begin to see a uh, pattern between painting, end of painting, formal reduction, political activism, and when political activism is uh, diluted, um, coming back to painting, and maybe painting only decorative painting. Significantly, the second last painting also emerged when abstraction reigned supreme over painting in the context of the dominant post-World War II artistic trend, abstract expressionism, an international movement whose champions included, amongst others, Pollock, Soudage, Lucio Fontana, and Marc Prosper. Its key players and inner circle of commentators saw so painting as premised on a clean slate a tabula rasa against previous generations. Every artist should paint as if each painting was a first painting, which is what goes hand in hand with the idea that painting is dead. The New York painter Barnett Newman explained retrospectively in an interview from the 1970s, uh, I quote, what it meant for me was that I had to start from scratch as if painting had never existed before, which is a special way of saying that painting was dead. Newman de Newman's declaration came with limitations because it, re uh, it referred to the death of a certain type of painting, narrative painting, descriptive painting, ornamental, and not the death of painting itself, which on the contrary is greatly valued. And uh, this is possible only because of the use of the English language, which conflicts painting with picture, whereas in French, for instance, you uh, separate and discriminate between peinture and tableau. So if you're speaking about the end of painting or the end of peinture in French, it's very clearly not the end of tableau itself, whereas in English you could say both things at the same time. So when Newman spoke about the death of painting, he specifically spoke about the death of painting as a genre, painting as tableau, and not about painting as paint on the surface. What was at stake, and this was valid for all abstract expressionist artists, was the possibility to produce first painting. However, within the movement, or at its border, it was also possible to raise the question of the fortal surpassing of painting and picture format once the enthusiastic period of reconstructing painting had gone and observation was made that this new painting was being rapidly swallowed by the very same institutional system it was supposed to fight and quietly reintegrated into the continuity of pictorial tradition. It was the case with Ad Reinhardt an enemy from within the New York Abstract Expressionist movement, 
since he participated to his group exhibition while being largely critical of his peers' aesthetic standpoints. In 1956, Reinhardt stopped using color and replaced it exclusively with black. The same year, he systematized his layering principle, which he had adopted since 1950, of vertical and horizontal grids applied on top of each other to saturate the surface of the canvas. So this is a very bad reproduction, especially with this kind of light. Um, it is not a monochrome, uh, completely monochrome painting. It is technically a monochrome painting, because there's only one color, and it is black. But there is uh, vertical brush strokes and horizontal brush strokes in the shape of a cross that you obviously cannot see here. Uh, which says a lot about the necessity to view actual works of art and not only work from reproduction. Um, from 1960 to his death in 1967, all his paintings were to be the same 5 by 5 fit piece black monochrome of nine identical, hardly visible squares. Reinhardt said about his paintings in 1966-1967, I'm quite simply making the last paintings that anyone can make. End of the book. In Reinhardt's view, if these paintings were ultimate, it was because the history of art finished with them, and future generations had to figure out what would come next, not him. In the end, Reinhardt's paintings were both first paintings and last paintings at the same time. In a note written during his final year, Reinhardt left a short description of himself. I quote, Post-historic artist, endless routine, history as we know it has come to an end, time has stopped, no man is entirely an artist. Around the same period in Europe, Lucio Fontana, a decisive figure of post-war Italian art, uh, who was also active in uh, Argentina, perpetrated his first expressive aggressions against the surface of the picture plate, left either white or painted in one color only, by punching holes in the canvas to the brush handle, in the series Holes, Buki, from 1949 to 1952, and then by, coating, by cutting through it in the series uh, Slashes, Tali, from 1958 onward. In doing so, Fontana marked the surpassing of painting through its extension in real space. He announced in the Technical Manifesto of Specialism in 1951, which is not signed by him but written by him, I quote, neither painting or sculpture, but shapes, colors, sounds in space. Uh, and this manifesto was written exactly when, uh, in 1961, when Fontana created, instead of a painting, an elaborate Arabic-like neon structure for the ninth final in Milan. From then on, all his works, whatever the medium, was to be specific materializations of one sole art category, which he named spatial, spatial concept, concepto spatiale. In 1955, he explicitly stated in the, in the introduction of the first issue of the review in Gesto, I quote, after Hiroshima and Nagasaki, painting was impossible. If Fontana did not give up painting in the end, it was because by making holes in the picture somehow, after he had reduced to monochrome the pictorial surface and the actual painting, he was opening up the picture to the space where it was placed, and thus reconfigured that space. Painting did not exist for itself anymore, but only as a contingent and yet powerful agent. During the 1960s, the question of the end of painting brought out with the reduction to monochrome and raised in the beginning by the two painters and isolated art scenes only, grew into a global phenomenon. So this cartoon works for uh, the United States, but in fact it has a more general 
内部出现的，但是它对整个世界的情况都是二十世纪六十年代的艺术家都产生了一些影响。Where you have no light, no image, and nearly no paint, no image. At the very moment when the image is being created, the image is being created. At the very moment when the object nature of the picture and the specificity of painting as a medium, as a genre that was totally distinct from sculpture, for instance, and whose practitioners therefore could be irrevocably identified as painters. were put forward under the logic of painting self-analysis, the relevance of the picture format and the pictorial medium was called into question, and the possibility of its obsolescence raised once again more generally. The 1960s were raisingly theological, and not only in the realm of the visual arts, because mainly for that one field at least, they were marking the last moment of a long period started in the 14th century with the arrival of Giotto's Maniera Moderna, so here is the modernity back again, but in the 14th century, which considered artistic creation as part of a linear progression or as embodying progress itself. During those years, artistic creation was governed as much by aesthetic possibilities as by a single mafia. Facing his or her canvas, the painter had to make decisions equally based on the need to bring something new and original and on the obedience of two moral propositions that was clearly articulated by Clemens Greenberg for the general career of the American uh, situation, but you have similar uh, ideas all over an ensemble country, which I dare not call Western now, uh, but which would be Northern America, South America, um, non-communist Europe, and uh, Japan. So politically, it is something like the Western alliance. Um, just to give another uh, background uh, to what we normally uh, take into consideration, which is Schoenberg's ideas. I want to remind you that those philosophers and theorists of literature who were the most read by the painters of the 1960s all over these countries uh, echo this fall of aesthetics into ethics. In 1953, Roland Barthes published Writing the Greece Zero and his article The Death of the Order of the Author in 1967. Theodor Adorno stressed in his 1958-1959 lectures that I quote, the prospect of radically destroyed or damaged works was the signature of the art of our time. Maurice Blanchot, from his part, making use of a literary, of a literary analysis to broaden his scope and include the visual arts, pointed that, I quote, uh, from uh, La Disparition de la Literature, the end of literature, in 1959, Every artwork has become the anxious and infinite self-search of its origin. So it's again this question of origin and end at the same time. We have been living ever since under the contemporary regime where all forms of aesthetics are able to create in a more or less sound but always in the realistic and where the field of artistic creation has been disproportionately stretched by Marcel Duchamp's ready created in 1913-1915, but whose consequences in terms of a potential disqualification of the physical input in the making of a work of art only became clear at the end of the 1970s. We also tend to forget that not so long ago it was not the case. We tend to forget it and pretend that we're living in this kind of global contemporary where no history is no longer applicable. Uh, but at the same time, and paradoxically, we are still requested to believe in the grand narrative produced by this radical point of view. 
那以实践拒绝将这些插画作作为一种对象，以配合的或者是具体的，或者是具体的，或者是具体的，或者是具体的，或者是具体的，或者是具体的，或者是具体的，或者是具体的，或者是具体的，或者是具体的，或者是具体
they propose, in a way, a radicalized version of the theory put forward by the American critic Carol Rosenberg, and regarded as a common truth by all action painters the world over. The famous quote by Rosenberg, what was to go on the canvas was not a picture, but an event. The quote was translated in French, in German, in Japanese, uh, in Italian, uh, in Spanish, very quickly after it was written in 1952. Uh, in this new version, the skip to canvas stays altogether in order to focus solely on the event or action in your state. I'll give just two examples. Uh, in Britain, it's what uh, Gustav Metzger is doing. So he is a kind of gestural abstract expressionist and a English version of it. Um, and you, he's painting paintings like this painting of Carlo from 1958. Then, in 1959, he has the idea that uh, there's a necessity to go beyond painting, so to focus on the event itself and to get rid of canvas and of paint altogether. And that's the moment when he invents auto-destructive art, uh, so in 1959, he first writes a statement about it, and then in action, um, in 1960, and then in 1961, it goes uh, one step further, uh, which is uh, putting some acid on canvas, on plastic canvas, and stopping the action of the acid before it completely destroys the painting. At least you take one photograph, and then letting the, the process go one step further. Um, if I anticipate on his returning to painting, uh, it's interesting that in, at the end of his life, uh, he was producing some paintings uh, that in fact he had never shown, I mean, since the 1950s, his earlier canvases uh, of the type I've seen, I, I've shown here. They were shown only in the last two years of his life. Um, and he, uh, also wrote about uh, painting in a way. Um, second example, that of Gutai in, in Japan. I could take uh, uh, a whole um, uh, discussion of that also. I'm just uh, summing it up with these two images. Uh, so starting in the early 1950s, some artists in Gutai, like Shiraga, for instance, uh, reduced painting to its uh, ultimate means. So you have monochromes, and because of the relationship with the uh, Japanese background, in a way, uh, they also refer to, for instance, cracks on pottery and things like that. So they are not exactly seen in the same um, context that they are seen in, in Europe at the same time. Shiraga's work is shown a lot in, in France, for instance. Uh, but I'm, I'm pretty sure in Japan, this work of, of cracks uh, was not seen as uh, completely in the uh, end of painting. It was more something uh, that had to do with a reduced version of painting that was extremely aestheticized, in a way. Um, and very soon afterwards, uh, you have the first actions which actually destroy painting. Destroy the support, like the, the famous action by Moakami, um, where he, um, the, the, the entrance to the exhibition room is a screen, so in Japan it would be the equivalent of uh, painting, and it is simply uh, transpersed by the body of the artist entering it. And I'm, I chose explicitly, I mean, voluntarily, not the very famous painting, and the end of the exhibition is the same, not the famous photographs that you see all the time of uh, Moakami uh, actually uh, puncturing the, the picture plane, but of the exhibition as a result. So you start by the destruction of the surface and you end with the destruction of the surface, and it is pretty much what happened. In fact, um, interestingly, I think that's how Gutai was seen in Europe, as a movement that would go from painting to uh, the disappearance of painting and performance. At least that's the way I was taught about Gutai uh, in the 1980s and 1990s. Um, 
The picture is much more complicated. Um, most of the Butai artists still were painting pictures. At the same time, they connected with uh, French abstract expressionism and uh, US abstract expressionism, especially through uh, the critic Michel Tapier. And, uh, but the discourse on Butai has always been that uh, it was very unfortunate for them to have met this French art critic because it uh, made them go back to painting whereas they, was, they were, and then become provincial again. Whereas uh, if they had stuck to uh, being progressive artists who had done with painting in favor of happening, they would have been immediately global um, or something like that. Um, in the same period, so I'm speaking about the mid 50s, early, uh, late 50s, uh, in the particular context of Brazilian modernism, uh, you find the same kind of uh, passage between gestural abstraction, I mean, abstraction and uh, something that goes beyond painting. Um, so, in the context of Brazil, uh, modernism is not equated in the late 50s with uh, abstract expressionism. It is uh, connected with concrete art. And there's a, uh, and that, that happens all the time when you're looking at really international situations. There are gaps and, and changes in the chronology. So if you look at the Brazilian art scene, what you have is first gestural abstraction in relationship with French abstract expressionism, then a superseding of abstract expressionism by geometrical abstraction, in relationship with, with, with what Max Beer is doing in Switzerland and, and Germany. Um, so, in the case of Lydia Clark or of uh, Elio Otishika, uh, you go from that kind of geometric painting to something else. So the story that we're normally told about Otishika is that basically he does things that look like um, ultimate paintings in 1959. Um, they are called inventions. And again, you find this kind of relationship between last paintings and first paintings. Um, so you have an example here. They are uh, monochrome squares. If you look at them, not in a reproduction, uh, but in the flesh, they are full of brush strokes and they are very textured and they are not at all passive uh, surfaces. Then, in 1960, he's supposed to have abandoned painting in order to do sculptures, the Bolides series. And uh, in 1964, you have wearable works that he calls Pahangoles. And they are supposed to be beyond painting. And in a way, they are, of course. The, I mean, the narrative is a little bit uh, oversimplified, but I won't go into too many details here, uh, because in fact, Otishika continues producing the invention paintings up till 1962, when he's supposed to have a well-known painting, first thing. Second thing, you can uh, look at the very pictorial aspect of his work from the 60s, either by concentrating on pure pigments in the Bolides, or in the Pahongoles, which are actually kind of movable paintings. Uh, and are, a lot of them are actually painted, or uh, tainted, which is not that uh, different. And um, in a way, but again, I won't delve too much into that. Uh, I think that uh, there's a return to painting in Fisica at the end of his life in the, uh, some constructions that he's doing, outdoor construction and indoor models, uh, where the walls are painted. And to cut a long story short, in the 1960s, when you're speaking about painting, you're conflating the idea of painting and picture in the general discourse on painting. Um, in the 1970s, after the quote unquote death of painting, uh, you can have tableaux which are not painting, just think about uh, some uh, large scale photographs from the Dusseldorf school or Jeff Wall uh, photographs, which he 
intent as pictures, tableau, um, and you can have paintings which are no longer uh, a square of canvas or a square of anything or a rectangle of any flat surface. It, it can be something on the wall or, or the wall itself or all that. Um, so you do have this kind of uh, return. Uh, in the case of Lydia Clark, um, you have the same movement, so to speak, um, a kind of inner destruction of painting, reduced to a so kind of uh, um, art concrete um, abstraction, geometrical and all that, except that the painting is in fact modular in the sense that it can be assembled and disassembled. If you look at the back of a painting, it's made of uh, small parts of, uh, of rectangles and, and that are uh, assembled like a puzzle. So, quite logically, in a way, the next step is to disassemble all that. And by 66, 67, she's going to the production of only objects that have nothing to do anymore with painting. I retain this um, date of 1966, 1967, because in a way that's when the uh, second wave of, of quitters arose. Now that the formalist logic, logic of modernism as a reduction of each medium to its specificity, an ID champion in the art critic arena by Clement Greenberg, had led to the minimalizing of pictorial events on a canvas to such an extent that to answer the question of how to go any further amounted to stepping aside in favor of other media or stopping any artistic practice altogether. I forget to include a slide of the dozens of artists who in 1964, 1965 produced monochrome paintings on a square format usually the monochromes being either grey, black or white. And you have that happening everywhere in these two years. Part of this group is Mel Bochner. And the way um, Mel Bochner has been written and talked about is usually to say, okay, so he's painting his last paintings in 1964-1965, then he goes into minimal, so with a kind of, of uh, series of the part progression uh, that you have here on the, on the right side, and conceptual at the same time with the uh, organizing of the working drawings and other visible things on paper not necessarily meant to be viewed as art uh, exhibition. Um, again, if we look more closely, we see that things did not happen exactly in the same way. Um, this is an example of one of the supposedly late last paintings by Buckner, and it's very far from uh, monochrome, grey, even painting on canvas. And when I did ask Buckner why he had uh, that everybody spoke about his, these paintings as if they were exactly that, he said because no one bothered to look at them. So uh, I just let go. But when you look at them, they have this um, surface. And at the same time, it's even more uh, a last painting, because it's fast what they are, or at least that's what Buckner says they are. You should never trust an artist completely. And you have no way of knowing uh, whether he actually tells the truth. What he says is that he was attempting to paint paintings, and each time he would do something, it would look like something else. And because of this idea of you have to behave ethically, not aesthetically, so the importance is not the end result of what you're doing, it's the way you're doing it. So you have to go one step further than the previous one. These were deemed by him unsuitable. So what he did was cover them with some kind of uh, refused painting that's laid around. It's not grey, it's actually a kind of uh, uh, dirt color, it's a mixture of, of what's around. And then covered them with a very thick, uh, thick uh, 
surface and then uh, scratch to the surface with his finger. So that's the kind of last painting he was doing, which is uh, a kind of um, rehearsal of the impossibility of going one step further and knowing that you don't want to stop with uh, the um, monochrome square gray uh, canvas. Um, in the French context, you have a similar thing happening with uh, Martin Barré. Uh, Barré, at the end of the 50s, reduces his paintings to um, a very limited amount of gestures. So it's still abstract expressionist in a way, but it's very reduced, so you have the bare canvas and slabs of paints painted on them and with just small hints of uh, black into the white. So you have the uh, kind of negative space becoming uh, positive. Then in 1964, and this is again very teleological in the sense, again it's kind of ethics of going one step further every time, he let go of the paintbrush and takes the spray can and, do, and does a series of uh, spray paintings which include paintings that are, that are explicitly staging the fact that they are last paintings. There is one which says uh, where you have the word written nul, nul in German, or um, nul. It's not the same meaning in German and in French. And in fact, the picture was sent to Brazil and then uh, was destroyed by fire, which is quite apt. And there are several paintings which have this circle in the middle of it of them and of course when you're painting a circle you're so painting a zero so it's the degree zero of painting remember above and it's also uh, a kind of uh, reduction of painting to its other limits in 1967 he stops painting and then does conceptual work and it's kind of uh, this work from 1970, completely or as much as possible tautological. So you have photographs of um, fixtures of, of um, furniture in the gallery space. So either uh, the lamp here or the uh, staircase ramp here uh, that are uh, shown alongside the object. Uh, they are uh, made with. Then, in 1970, he stops working completely. So, because what he says is that um, it's impossible to have a complete tautology, so you'd rather completely stop than do uh, anything else. Um, I'll come back to Martin Barre's later work afterwards, because he stops but not completely. In fact. Um, these two waves were not only the, but the, the product of our history, internal reasons, like I, I stated in the case of uh, Barre and Bachmann, but also the result of political commitment. And you have strongly um, left-wing artists in these various countries abandoning painting for political reasons. It's the case, for example, of Pierre Duranguillot in France, who uh, makes versions of Mondrian's compositions with uh, camouflage uh, fabric. It's in the context of post-Algerian uh, war, uh, so it's anti-colonial and all that, and it's denouncing the kind of um, grip on power that abstraction was meant to have, this idea that of uh, Mondrian that, that painting was supposed to change the world, so it's showing how authoritarian it is. Um, these are Buraglio's last paintings in 1968. Then, in 1968, alongside the May 68 movement in France, uh, Buraglio, who is um, a strong Maoist, uh, philosopher and, and uh, artist, and it doesn't mean the same thing in France 
and in China. It involves doing some paintings, but in a propaganda style, and without any kind of uh, subjectivity, any kind of artistic intent, or anything. And they've all been lost, because he didn't think they had any artistic interest. So that's the case for uh, an exhibition he organized in support of the Vietnam uh, War against uh, the US. And then he stopped painting to go to work in a factory uh, for several years. So from 1968 to 1974, he's not doing any artwork. He's only uh, working as a worker in a factory, not because he's forced to do so. He just wants to do so. Um, and Again, the story is a little bit more complicated because if you look at what he at, at the, the moment, you can see that in fact, he was still doing images and producing images, but they have a political nature. And there are the kind of things uh, that I reproduce here uh, on the cover of this uh, Small publication for uh, PPT. Uh, property owners in France. Or in the German situation, the end of painting is uh, political issues. You have uh, and not at all going through abstraction. Uh, um, so, from the 1960s, works that are paintings, uh, kind of expressionist paintings, uh, Schoenbeck was uh, at the time still pretty close to uh, Baselitz, but they had strong political iconography. So you have portraits of Mao, you have portraits of Mayakovsky, you have portraits of Trotsky, you have portraits of revolutionary figures of the uh, uh, year in the 20th century. Then, in 1967, there is his last painting, which is this woman of the ruins. So it is a reflection on German history, a question of uh, political involvement in the thing, and then he stopped painting once and for all, for what he meant. Um, and I say it's political because he had strong political commitment at the time. The same kind of thing as, um, as uh, behind the European Marx and Queen European uh, Agitation. But in fact, there is no declaration, no interviews that explain his uh, gesture of, still, of stopping completely. Um, and he, shows his, I mean, he shows up at the openings of his solo exhibition that he did in 2011, for instance. And if you interview him, he just says, I have nothing to say. He's very, I mean, spending an afternoon with someone who just ends. When you're asking him things, he just says, I have nothing to say. I can't explain. I don't want to explain. Uh, he just looks at his side by himself. But the thing is that he actually stopped painting completely. And there's no return in his case. Even now that his paintings are selling for large numbers and, 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 uh, and that he has had uh, retrospective. And he is happy with showing the works and everything. And when you go to his uh, apartment, there's, uh, 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 there are some paints and things lying around, but, but you know, he says that he's not painting. And they seem to be completely... I don't know whether it's staged or not, and whether after his death we discover that in fact he had been painting or was doing something like that, but it's, uh, it's impossible. Third explicitly stated reason for quitting in the same years, 1966, 1967, um, the injection of the art market to the decisive influence on the art field over the period. That's the most 
I mean, that's the reason given by Agnes Martin uh, most of the time. Um, Agnes Martin also used Martin painting to uh, a kind of minimal attraction in the early 1960s in the vicinity of the Then, in 1967, her works are only uh, gray washes of acrylic mixed with uh, graphite on canvas of the type of trumpet. Uh,他的画,他的画布上做一些非常简单的一些画作 in New Mexico, and doesn't do painting for a long time, I'll come back to that. One of the interesting things is that it's nearly impossible to show in an exhibition. So, uh, for instance, in the recent Agnes Martin retrospective, there was a sign on the wall that was saying that there were no paintings produced between 1967 and 1974, that was the only way that you could know that it was actually a break in the work and a long one. And in most books, including uh, the recent uh, biographies of Agnes Martin's that have been published, people would say, oh, it's for psychological reasons. But again, what I want to emphasize is that for psychological reasons, everybody stops in the same period. It means that there's something else. And it's difficult to discriminate between these various uh, uh, reasons, but there are uh, important. So, we have Agnes Martin building a house in Cuba, New Mexico, and uh, cooking and building and building uh, and welcoming people sometimes, and sometimes not, etc. Um, it is a situation that the critic Jean Clay I quote, in a system whose only left motivation seems to be its own survival, a system that produces for the sake of being, and whose unique goal is to make profit, and that is not strong enough to nurture a convincing collective project for the new generation, the triumphant practice of painting looks anything but that third. Remember, he's speaking about 1972, not about now. During the 1960s, the art market in the Western world experienced a massive shortage of work. Um, one of the consequences was the rising conflict between the disruptive will of Vanguard and the quasi-immediate hijacking by buyers, constantly on the lookout for new products. This is very important. In fact, what links these three ideas, formal reduction, ethically, it has to be difficult, it has to go one step further, political motivation, and the artistic social context is actually the art market. I think it's the most, uh, it's ultimately the thing that binds these three, three aspects. Um, the fact that you couldn't produce something that would survive the market, I mean, that would uh, completely be outside the market. In 1966, the American critic Sam Hunter um, representative of modern politics, noted as a result that, I quote him, the standard period between the moment of the artistic creation and the one of its accepting by the public is starting to disappear. In that situation, it did not suffice in order to state a dissenting position, to just reduce painting to hardly anything, or inversely to clutter it with all sorts of unrelated objects that serve nothing but painting down its position. If one wanted to prove one's hostility to the system, one had to get rid of painting completely. And I give two last examples of these last paintings. I'm going to do something else. Uh, in the case of art and language, 
Referencing the idea of Malevich and uh, and the painting, and when they work together, uh, then they do, for example, the secret painting series, which is uh, of the last painting because it's indescribable to uh, something else. So you have a black square, and next to it, the caption for the painting which is uh, gigantic compared to the normal size of the wall label. Uh, proclaiming the, the content of this painting is invisible, the character and dimension of the content are to be kept permanently secret, known only to the artist. Um, and so it means that there is something under the cover of the last painting. And from there, um, they move to completely conceptual practice. Uh, in the journal, in the journal of language, and in the uh, administrative conceptual works of the 1960s to uh, late 1960s to the late 1970s. Uh, another, so the last example, the last painting, Lilo Zano. Um, so again, the story is normally she's doing abstract paintings, which have some kind of texture to it. In 1965, you have these kinds of things, which are actually derived from sexual imagery, even though you don't see the sexual imagery that much in uh, those uh, late 65 uh, aspects, so you don't see it at all. In fact, I, I don't see it at all, but I, I know what it's coming from. Um, as, and as a reaction to the idea of specific objects, she basically leaves painting and start doing some conceptual work, work which encompasses the idea not only of the end of painting, but the idea of the end of art. Except that it's a provisional end of art, because it's not the end of art itself. The work of art is a strike of art, general strike piece that she devised in uh, February 1969. Uh, so stopping doing work and stopping uh, going to see works and all that. The only thing, again, so the narrative is pretty clear, and after that, a period which goes between 1970 and 1971, she quits doing any artworks and leaves the job and, and all that. And that has been talked about also in psychological terms and all that. But again, the dates are pretty uh, clear. I just want to um, complexify the narrative a little bit. In 69, she still does the Wave series for an exhibition at the Whitney. So there are paintings. Even if they look very monochromatic, but they are in complex paintings that are done in one session, and it involves drug taking and all that to be able to produce the artwork. Uh, and in fact, in her notes, in the various pieces, she writes in her notebooks, and I'm not considered uh, completely uh, conceptual works, uh, she signs them as such. Uh, there are some talks about returning to painting, and, uh, except that she never did, but um, she doesn't quit painting completely. And I don't know if the fact that she punched holes in uh, some of her earlier paintings in 
And in the determinate period that goes between 69 and 70, 71, is not a way uh, of uh, affirming the existence of paintings in another way, after its reduction to something or through its um, very death. So in her case, what we are left with are in fact this double body of uh, conceptual pieces and uh, this kind of abstract, post-abstract because of the uh, actuality of the holes that are punched into the canvas um, and um, existing side by side. The return to painting I want to speak about now happened gradually and in distinct stages as well. At the beginning of the 1970s, it appeared possible to some painters to substitute the rhetoric of painting and its foretold death uh, with one of constant restarting from scratch, all the more so as the art market was crashing down following the economic crisis of the 1970s. Uh, so the um, end of the uh, gold standard in 1971 for the American economy and the world economy and uh, the oil crisis in 1973. That's when we had Agnes Martin resuming uh, painting, but resuming painting as if so. Uh, in a way, she had to go all the way to this idea that painting was no longer possible because it was so reduced that there was no possible step further to the idea that it was not necessary to do one step further, but just to concentrate on this first stage. Um, before resuming painting, she's doing uh, a portfolio of screen prints in 1971 called On a Clear Day, and they are establishing a kind of vocabulary uh, for painting. So it's just um, ruled lines on paper uh, with um, very simple grids evolving one from the other. Then in 1974, she resumes painting completely with uh, these kinds of works, which are uh, at the beginning very uh, small, 30 centimeters uh, square. Um, and you could see immediately that she's reinstating color, reinstating uh, tonal variations, and all that. But it's as if, I mean, what I would say is that she's painting after the death of painting. She's acknowledging the fact that something, that one story is finished, and that there is another story that's possible, or maybe it's not a story anymore. It, it is something that's more, I mean, if we think about this, uh, geographical, temporal version of modernism, then we have something like that happening here. Uh, the same thing happens roughly in the same years with Martin Barré. So he stops doing painting in 67, stops doing artworks altogether in 1970, and in 1972, 1973, resume doing abstract paintings uh, that look geometric, but are in a way uh, trying to be first paintings. And completely, and it's the same thing as in Agnes Martin at the same time, without knowing each other, um, and it is reinstating the conditions for painting, finding a system that would be entirely uh, inner uh, organized without any exterior determination. So in this case, it means measuring the canvas, um, organizing the intervals, and from that deriving the structure of the composition, deriving uh, the colors, then uh, degrading the colors, defacing the colors, so that you are left with kind of remnants of something. And you don't know whether it's first on the verge of being, I mean, nation on the verge of becoming something else or disappearing uh, that's uh, stated. In the work of Burak Guillot, you have the same thing. So after he gets bored with working in a factory and just thinks uh, this is enough political commitment um, for a while, 
uh, he returns to doing artwork, but he's not pretending to leave aside what he has experienced before. So it's also a kind of painting after the death of painting that he's doing. So what he does is basically look around himself, find some elements that look like painting and that are actually ready-made. So elements of uh, windows or elements of uh, any type of frames that have this kind of rectangular aspect without putting any uh, extra paint on them, just finding the things as they are, and choosing them for that uh, reason and doing some work from that. And he's still doing uh, those kind of um, of work. Um, in the early 1980s, others clearly thought that stepping aside was not enough to protect the autonomy of the artists as they were completely accepted and thereby hijacked by the market. While the return to painting initiated by a new generation was was called Neo-Expressionism, uh, with painters such as uh, Julian Schnabel or uh, Georg Baslitz, um, could act as a stimulus for choosing to wrestle with the medium again, either with the aim of paradoxically fighting the market, uh, buoyed by the robust health of the German economy and Reagan neoliberal measures, or on the contrary, uh, fully capitalizing on it. Even then, Exogenous factors to the history of art uh, were to play a major role right from the beginning of the 1970s, but with different time frames depending on national context. One of the most important was the demise of political utopias after the failure of the 1960s radical protest movement, which adopted, it, and it's, you can see it in the works of, uh, and in the fact that they stopped work, uh, for instance, example, in Uruguay, I could have uh, had it uh, Olivier Mosse or Marsha Hafi in various contexts. Um, Marcus' statement so frequently quoted at the time, the most beautiful work of art will be the revolutionary society. So there's no reason to do artwork when the actual artwork could be society. So when this uh, utopia is uh, done with or is considered a failure, then it's possible to come back to painting and that's something akin to what happened, for example, for Malievich or for Vorchenko or for Tatin, except that it's freely chosen and not uh, premised by uh, the, the political power. Uh, even then you can resist, I mean you can do that with a kind of uh, internal resistance and, and with a vengeance. And I think that's what in particular art and language did uh, in 1980, 1979, 1980, when they did the whole series of uh, the various uh, portraits of Lenin uh, in the style of Jackson Pollock. So what they were speaking about was uh, the impossibility or the um, inacceptability of just returning to painting as if nothing had happened before, as if expressionism and subjective expressionism was still possible in the context, and criticizing it with a political intent that is pretty tongue-in-cheek. It is coming from the left, very clearly, and both Mel Ramsden and uh, Baldwin, Michael Baldwin, are uh, still leftists, um, but it is saying also uh, that if you have this kind of political commitment, you, uh, it's difficult to read in a way. And I think their return to painting uh, is uh, based on the idea that painting is an incredibly resistant medium, that it is uh, paradoxically not very suitable for much for commodification, if you do it in a certain way which is their ways of, of doing it, um, or it is, but in, in a kind of toxic way, uh, that is much more uh, efficient, according to them, and I, I do follow them, uh, than the kind of uh, com completely conceptual or installation-based uh, way of doing things. So this is a very explicit case of mixing Jackson Pollock and Lenin image 
you have a lot of other examples in their works where you are faced with something that looks like a complete abstraction, and in fact, it is a portrait of Lenin, um, and it's the mixture of the two. You also have this kind of return to painting in Mel Bachner's work. Um, first, in a very conceptual way, in the theory of painting uh, work from 1969-1970, so it's very quick, in a way, this kind of return to painting. He's one of the first ones, I mean, what I find interesting is that when he's doing this work, no one sees it as, as painting. Because in the context of the late 1960s, a painting has to be a rectangle on the wall. Everybody sees it as installation, conceptual art, having nothing to do with painting, maybe just retaining the, the color. When the work has been shown in the past 15 years, it's immediately seen by anyone as painting and as explicitly painting. And with the kind of um, uh, pleasure and color and all that that you have. And in fact, uh, Bachner explains that the work was a commentary on Matisse's images of, of I mean, the, the, these images where you see um, a very old Matisse working on his uh, cutout. Uh, but then you have works by Bachner, which at the same time confronts and address uh, the neo-expressionist works from the early 1980s, and at the same time displace them. I don't know whether they are successful. Uh, I must say that I've always had some problems with these kinds of paintings every time I see them. Um, maybe they are particularly ugly. Uh, even, but I think it's made on purpose uh, to counter effects the kind of neo-expressionist work that's going around him pretending to be to do as if painting was still alive whether he is painting as if painting has been really dead and, and was impossible to uh, revive I've drawn and, and, and of course you have the more recent series of painting. There was one to um, open the, um, the lecture. Uh, here's another one from 2015 uh, by Bachner. Um, I have established very quickly a temporary typology. It should be completed, um, especially with, rega with rega um, regarding the eastern part of Europe. Uh, and I asked myself before doing this lecture whether it was applicable to, to China. And what's interesting is that the chronology is not the same. Uh, but you do have, I think, for what I know, a quite similar thing happening between um, the STARS movement in 78 and 79 and the uh, Jamen Dada uh, in 1985, 1986. So you would have, the chronology is completely uh, displaced in the course of like 20 years. The political implications are not the same, but they are very strong in both cases. Um, I mean, either in Wang Keping or in uh, Wang Yongping, at the time of Jiamen Dada, there was a strong political uh, impact and, and import. Uh, and maybe the return to painting also happened in China in the 1990s, or something like that. I'm speaking specifically in the kind of work that would fit into global contemporary, and not about uh, Chinese traditional painting. But uh, that would be um, another uh, story, and I, I, I think um, it shows, and I want to end up with that, uh, that even if we are trying to complexify our stories, even if we are thinking of how to globalize them, because uh, maybe it seems in China very usual to speak about the Americas, Europe, Japan, as if it was a part of a global uh, situation, but it is very uh, um, seldom done in uh, Europe either. Um, so we know that all this work is in fact very difficult to do because we have to focus on specificities and especially I think we have to be particularly careful about chronologies and the fact that time 
and contexts are meaningful when we look at artworks. It's not only about forms, it's not only about colors and shapes, it's also about something that is inside uh, and sometimes not completely visible but very active, which is the background, the context, the reasons why things happen and uh, why we uh, still consider them important. Thank you. I think it's very interesting you use the uh, Japanese example of the crack of Karasu, and you, as you rightly mentioned, that to some extent it display the tradition of ceramics in Japan. So, whereas from a Western narrative, it could be seen as a death, but from a Japanese perspective, you could say it's a celebration of painting collapsing ceramics pattern into two-dimensional painting, that the cracks as a kind of abstract art may be quite modern in the Western sense, but is highly traditional from a Japanese tradition. And dress oil painting is a sort of main thing in Europe, but is important to Japan. The tradition is brush painting and ceramics. So, so from a from a more global perspective, um, and how you see this painting? Is it is it really death of painting, or is it actually something very different? I, I, as I said, I, I, it's I mean it's pretty strange because I hadn't thought about this example. I was thinking more about other works by Shiraga, the, the the kind of gestural abstraction made with the body and, and all that. And then I was selecting my images for the PowerPoint. And I, uh, and I just thought, oh, okay, it is more complicated than I thought. Exactly for this reason. Because, um, it's very difficult to know when speaking about Butai or writing about Butai, whether they are actually uh, addressing their work to only the Japanese viewers and only in the Japanese context or whether uh, they want to be part of an uh, international and at the time international way meant uh, Western, non-communist, non-colonial world. So to be part of a dialogue with Europe and Western Europe and, and, and the US. And um, what I, I finally chose this work because it is completely ambiguous, as you said. Uh, and there is this ambiguity in, in Japan and Japanese tradition in ceramics, which I find really fascinating when a part is painted, because the idea that you can have a dead object, but it's reborn in a way, because you have the cracks and because it can be repaired, and repairing it is part of making it new and changing it and, and something like that. So, I think it acknowledges both the kind of um, fragility, death of painting in a way, or uh, the fact that our words are bound to be deteriorating. Uh, because cracks in painting is not exactly the same thing as a crack in a ceramic. Uh, and the fact that it's uh, a kind of um, um, meta uh, quality of the object, which can be at the same time completely reduced and extremely complex. Uh, and I don't know, I think, I mean, what I thought about after um, choosing this image is that I, I should work on that. Uh, but I don't think that means so it's going to be, it's going to be impossible. So we said one more question. Which is not.